Good afternoon. How's everybody doing today? My name is uh, Jim Mingus. I'm the director of the Mission Command Center of Excellence at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. I'm uh, Dave Bassett. I'm the uh, PEOs for Command Control, Communications, Tactical out of Aberdeen, Maryland. Yeah, and uh, Dave and I, for about the next 20, 25 minutes, are going to tag team on the two uh, different topics that we're going to be talking about. Dave and I, for about the next 20, 25 minutes, are going to tag team on the two topics that you see up here. And it's going to dovetail very, very nicely into our Ranger buddy who's standing here back here, Major General Pete Gallagher, the network uh, CFT lead, and he's going to follow us, and it'll make sense to you in terms of how this is going to flow. If we could bring up the uh, first chart, please. It was literally um, about a year ago, last week, when we started the series of deep dives with the Chief Staff of the Army on how we're going to get after fixing the tactical network. Uh, that, that effort lasted several months, and I think many of you that were at uh, USA last fall, we talked to you a little bit about uh, what was going on with that, but uh, it's, it's coming even further. Uh, that plan has been, been approved, and we're kind of moving out on that. Uh, when it was all said and done, and when we simplified it down as, as much as we could, there were four imperatives, four things that we said that we absolutely had to fix. We had to fix our uh, Mission Command suite of applications, which I'll talk about here in a little bit, little bit. We had to fix the physical infrastructure of our command post. We had to fix our interoperability, both joint and coalition. And finally, we had to finish or fix um, the disparate nature of our tactical network, both the upper and the lower tactical network, into a uh, what people talk about as an integrated tactical network, but as you think of it from end to end, it's really a unified tactical network. Dave and I are going to talk about those first two, the command post and the common operating environment, and then Pete's going to come up here in a little bit, and he's going to talk to you about uh, the, the last two. Uh, but what I did want to anchor us back to is we spent a lot of time with this, and some may have seen this already, uh, with the chief personally going through this in almost every single word. And we continually anchor back to this, and what you'll see in both the common operating environment and the command post, we get after about five or six either characteristics or technical network requirements associated with what the chief kind of laid out for us almost a year ago in terms of his vision. And so that's the importance of this. It has been our guiding uh, kind of point, and will continue to be so into the future. You go to the next uh, slide, please. Okay, those that have not been inside of a brigade or a division talk lately, but if you were to walk inside of one, you're probably familiar with many of these systems that are out there. But there are, are roughly, depending on the size and the echelon that you're in, anywhere between 15 and 17 disparate battle command systems that we use to command and control our maneuver formations in the Army. They are things like CPOF, they are TAS, they are ANDUs, they are AFATAS, they are GEEKS, they are uh, GCS Army, 17 of those things, none of which were built to operate seamlessly back and forth and amongst themselves. Now, we have figured out ways over the years to make them talk to each other. We have figured out patches and gateways, and we, we've tried to figure out how to make them all talk to each other. But if you look at that picture in the, kind of the top left there, you add the complexity of those 17 battle command systems that I just discussed, the complexity of the physical infrastructure of our command posts, the complexity of our lo lower and our upper tactical internet, and frankly, you have a mess when you're dealing with a peer competitor. It goes back to one of the, those four things that we had to fix. So in January, uh, we brought to an AROC and the Chief Staff of the Army approved the ISICD for the common operating environment. And the basic premise behind that from a operator's perspective, and Dave's gonna talk to you about the, the, the uh, details of that, is we are gonna take a standardized and pull in all that data layer, there's going to be a common computing environment sitting on top of that, and instead of having all these disparate, complete, total stovepipe systems, it will literally be applications by warfighting function that right on top of that common operating environment. And that's what you kind of see uh, going to the bottom right-hand side. When Dave gets done talking about how this works now from a technical perspective, I will come back and uh, talk about now the physical infrastructure, what we're doing there for the command post. Dave, what do you do? All right. Uh, and so, so the convergence that uh, Jim just talked about is important not only from the software perspective, but also from a hardware perspective. And so when you have a, a single common core that things run on top of, you don't have to run all of the disparate servers that you're seeing here. And so when we talk about making things smaller and, and, and giving less kit to the users in the field, it's not just about uh, converging those mission command systems. Uh, and and you're, it's not just the, hard, the, the software that gets made simpler, the hardware is made simpler as well. So you have a fewer number of servers running an even smaller, more tightly dense packed uh, server stack. You can go to the next slide. And so when you look at the way industry develops these things, if you want to write code, if you want to write a software application for an iPhone or an Android phone, 
one of the first things you'll do is you'll download uh, the software development kit for that environment. And there's a standard set of tools that you know you need to comply with if you want to put your application within that environment. There's some things you just don't write over again. And there's a standard rule set, uh, for example, and I'm not going to pull out my iPhone because I promised I wouldn't, but if you want to put your app in that environment, there's certain rules that your code has to follow, certain common framework components that you have to use. You have to write to the screen in a certain way. And so by doing that, they can guarantee that your application doesn't take down the whole phone. And so really that kind of describes where we're trying to go uh, in the future in the Army's mission command environment. And what that means is that we want to be able to provide to industry a common mission command software development environment so that instead of asking you to bring your entire server stack to the field for the soldiers to operate and maintain, you're instead delivering an application which sits on top of the common operating environment that uh, General Mingus just described. There are some components of those, some of what we may pick may have some proprietary components, but we want to build them together in a way that it exposes the right interfaces so that application developers kind of understand the rule set for building mission command applications within that environment. And so where that gets us is three environments, essentially three common operating environments. And this is not unlike what you see when you go and look at, uh, see Android or, or an Apple environment. You have one that operates on your phone, in this case an end user device for dismounted soldiers. You have a second which operates uh, for the mounted environment. These are the computers that are mounted inside of combat and tactical vehicles. I sort of think of this as analogous to a tablet environment. And then you have a third which operates at the headquarters, at the command post, which is more analogous to uh, your desktop operating environment. And although each of those three pieces of software may be different, you're going to have a rule set for operating in each of them. And so uh, today, uh, we're exploring some unique dismounted uh, operating environment. We have uh, a common tool set, we think, that will allow you to write this, essentially the same code base between mounted and the command post computing environment. Different tools, some different capabilities, but we want to make that entire software development environment clear so that industry partners know how to plug in and know how to deliver innovative capabilities uh, for our warfighters. Okay. Next chart, please. So we've talked a lot about the network, and General Gallagher is going to come up here in a second and talk about the other half of this, but I'm going to have to admit I don't understand all seven layers of the network, but I do remember the other version which has four. You know, there's a physical layer, there's an application layer, there's a data layer, and then there's a transport layer. But many times in the military, we don't think about how does that now integrate into the way we fight, how we lead, how we execute mission command. And the physical infrastructure of our command post is critically important to that ecosystem so that as General Abrams says all the time, this ought to enable leaders and commanders to fight and win from their time and place of choosing anywhere on the battlefield. And that's why this, the uh, command post, the physical infrastructure of that is so critically important. When we talk about command posts, what is that? Well, you have a home station mission command. You have in route. You have early entry command posts. You have, once you get to the tactical edge, you have a um, mobile command group. You have tacks. You have mains. You have a support area command group. Across three different types of formations, if you're just talking maneuver. So heavy, light, and striker. Now you add in multifunctional and functional brigades, and you can see how this gets very complicated very quickly. So that's kind of how we ended up with this mess that you see kind of in the lower left, which worked in a static environment. When you didn't have to jump, when you didn't have to worry about being contested in multiple domains that were out there. But as we started to kind of move towards training against a peer competitor and large scale ground, to, to prevail in large scale ground combat, it became readily apparent that the command post that we have today will not survive tomorrow. And so we had to do something pretty quickly. Now, the good news, and Dave and I talked about this, in fact, the others that do requirements interact with this, we're kind of embarrassed by this, because we should have been able to help units. But if you look in the center, units kind of figured this out on their own. And so they kind of came up with their own solution, which is what this command post initiative kind of reflects. And it comes in three phases. First, there was a directive requirement uh, that was signed by General Murray in December. And what we are going to do is we're going to prototype one core, two divisions, one of each type of BCT, so an S and I and an A, an IBCT, an SBCT, or striker and a heavy brigade, and then four multifunctional and functional brigades with using ISO containers, expando vans, command post support vehicles, wireless, and smart power. Those are the five critical elements. But we want to figure out, okay, what is the right combination?
across all those things that I talked about in the different types of command posts, what's the optimal solution going forward? Phase two, after we've kind of learned from that, we will take five brigade combat teams of all of uh, the flavors, and we will begin now the integration of some of the command post computing environment and common operating and stuff, uh, the, the uh, ne integrated tactical network uh, that uh, General Gallagher is going to talk about, so that it is truly an ecosystem. And finally, the third phase, which will come to an AROC in May, June time frame, back to the Chief, is a program um, called the CPI2 CVD, which will drive this as a program of record going forward. And so that's kind of where we're at today. We, be, we plan on that phase one that I described starting this summer fall, uh, working that prototype. So, so, so the thing I'll add to it is this was no single program of record that got us to where we are today. It's been a collection of changes that have been made over the years. <laughs> and units really, I, I think out of desperation, have gone off and tried to figure this out on their own. And what we see at the training centers is every unit comes up with a different solution. And so what we really want to do is get the best of those things through the experimentation that Jim Mingus just talked about and then provide that across the formations in a standard way so that we have one way of training this, one way of operating this, and we don't require soldiers to learn a different method every place they go. Um, the, the other thing, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pitch it back to you because I just drew a blank, Jim. Can you, can you finish or something? Okay. All right, thanks. The last thing we were going to say about this was you know, I, I described all those formations. Once we've kind of figured out what the right combinations are, because this is scalable, it's modular, think about Legos, um, that's really what this is. So depending on the type of formation you're dealing with, it's, it's uh, in its final form will be very agile and adaptive based on the circumstances. I, as an example, we, uh, we're thinking about in that future fight that I described, will a single tack be enough from a redundancy and survivability perspective? Uh, if it's truly a plug-and-play Lego-like environment, we may have to have two tacks and a smaller main, or we, we may have to have a, a, a more robust support area command post to deal with uh, things on the back end of that. So the whole idea behind it is that it's modular and skilled. Go ahead. Yeah, sure I, I got over my senior moment. So uh, thanks. So when we talk about doing acquisition differently, one of the things we talk about is starting with experimentation, forming requirements and then using those requirements to shape the material solution. And this is just, I think, another great example of where we're not trying to lead with a description of the perfect command post. We're saying we want to move out, we want to prototype this thing, we're going to get feedback on it, we're going to do it across each of the brigade formations, and then we're going to deliver capability that allows our soldiers to train in a common way across our formations. So I think it's a great example of a new way of doing business. <laughs> okay, with that, uh, what have we got about five minutes, 10 minutes, five minutes? Okay. We got about five minutes for uh, any questions or comments that you might have for either Dave or I. Quite shy, yes, ma'am. Back. So, when talking about the different applications, you want to just all hand. So, when talking about the different applications that you have that will be working within this, um, one of the challenges <coughs> have been within the network enterprise centers is EFCs and having those applications come down and interact with other applications and having to have elevated privileges to have access to those portions of the training software. Has anyone started looking at solving that issue for both industry and for the training departments? Yeah, so as we approach this, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to work hand in hand with the synthetic training environment and with that CFT. And that kind of authorizations and privileges piece has got to be part of the things we think through as we engineer that solution. So I, it, it, it's clearly on our radar. And just to add to that, Maria Grace, who's my neighbor and also on Fort Leavenworth with us, even before the cross-functional team stood up, um, you know, her and I came together to ensure that these requirements documents moved together at the same time. Because in the past, when you went to a mission training complex or a sim center, that was typically a different environment um, and a different set of tools in which you had to train them or to fight them. That will no longer be so the synthetic training environment, this environment, it's the same suite of tools, the same applications in that open architecture. Any other questions? Wow, Obviously they want to hear from General Gallagher. He is he is the star. I mean if they uh, and he is a powerful and handsome man. Can we can we see the remainder of our time to General Gallagher? Okay. All right, seriously, any other comments or questions? Okay, if not, then uh, really appreciate your time. 
and uh, appreciate your support for this. We look forward to your ideas on how to get after some of this on the back end of uh, the experimentation and demonstration we're going to do with a lot of this. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.